Welcome to another episode of the Alpha Mind Podcast, where we have amazing conversations with outstanding people from the world of trading and investing. Our guests include traders, analysts, trading and investing psychologists and coaches, writers, and an array of experts on all things trading. What we really want to get to on this podcast is clear answers to the question, what leads to great trading performance? Over the past couple of years, we have chatted with numerous guests about the things they have learned on their own personal journeys through the markets. In this podcast, myself, Stephen Goldstein, and my co-host, Mark Randall, ask the questions, have the conversations, and go to places so that you can learn from others and challenge yourself to improve and get better. Today, we are delighted to chat with Brent Donnelly. Brent has been in and around trading for close to three decades and has held major trading roles at investment banks and hedge funds with a strong emphasis on the FX and global macro markets, which he has been involved in in both market making and proprietary trading roles. Brent started trading in 1995 and has worked at several illustrious firms in the financial markets, including Citibank, Merrill Lynch, Royal Bank of Canada, Lehman Brothers, Graham Capital, Nomura Bank and HSBC. Since 2004, Brent has been writing a brilliant free daily newsletter on the markets called AMFX. This newsletter is read widely by pro traders across the world inside investment banks, hedge funds, asset management firms and even central banks. If you want to read what the guys moving the markets are reading, you want to be reading this free newsletter. Back in my trading days, this was a must read Brent has also authored two books, The Art of Currency Trading, and his most recent book, Alpha Trader, The Mindset, Methodology, and Mathematics of Professional Trading. Brent has recently set up a new venture, Spectrum Markets, which he describes as real-world market intelligence for every trader and investor. Before each podcast, we normally play a few excerpts from the interview. For this episode, we had so many excerpts and outtakes set aside for this clip they could almost have been an entire podcast themselves. Now, whether you are an experienced market professional, a seasoned retailer, or someone new to the markets, I guarantee you will get something out of listening to Brent's thoughts, reflections, and wisdom on trading and markets, which he discusses in a very honest and humble manner, which itself is refreshing. Anyway, here are just a couple of the excerpts which we set aside. Especially when you you meet your first, you know, three or four years of success, it's easy to be overconfident and that can lead to a lack of conscientiousness because, you know, you're, you're having fun and you're, you know, maybe going out at night and not doing the work during the day. Um, And then eventually that leads to subpar performance. So, you know, some things you try to improve and then some things you just have to admit your weakness and then introduce friction around unwanted behaviors or um, or find ways to, to change your process so that it deals with that willpower and, or, or whatever that thing is instead of smashing your head against the wall, trying to fix something that maybe can't be fixed. Now, a lot of things can be, but I think it's also useful to just admit, okay, I have a weakness here now. How can I modify my process to address that weakness if I'm not going to be able to level up that weakness. And then the next question is, how do you succeed in the long run? Because many traders will do well for three years, four years, five years, and then peter out or, or crash. Or We are sure you will get a lot out of this podcast. And if you do enjoy it, as a reminder, we would be delighted if you could rate our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or whichever service you use to listen to the Alpha Mind podcast. And even better, if you could leave a friendly review. We are delighted with the growth of the Alpha Mind podcast audience and we are increasingly attracting listeners from beyond the field of trading who see us as a resource in the performance psychology space. Just recently, we were informed that we were ranked number five in the top 25 UK psychology podcasts by Feedspot, which is a great place for finding and keeping track of interesting stuff on the web. Before we hear from our guest, we would like to mention that a big part of what we do is about arming people to be at their very best. And a big part of being at your very best is having the best tools, the best training and the best education possible. That is why we partner with the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA, as our sponsorship partner. 
The quality of your output will be determined to a large part on the quality of your input. The STA are one of the world's leading providers of education in technical analysis. It is one thing to learn technical analysis from a five minute YouTube video, but it's quite another to study technical analysis on an STA program created by some of the leading people globally within their field. If you are serious about becoming a serious trader, then learning technical analysis properly should be something you should consider. This is why we highly recommend looking into the STA Technical Analysis Home Study Course, which is an online version of the course which supports their diploma program that is delivered at the world-renowned London School of Economics. AlphaMind podcast listeners can get a discount to this course by visiting our AlphaMind blog page, that's alphamindblog.blogspot.com, or just Google AlphaMind blog and go to the page link STA Home Study Course. Now, on with this week's podcast. Well, welcome to this week's Alpha Mind podcast, uh, and we're privileged to have Brent Donnelly with us, um, an author of the Alpha Trader, the Art of Currency Trading. But he's been a professional trader for more than two decades, and during that time, he's worked as a senior foreign exchange dealer at some of the biggest banks in the world. He has traded global macro for a Connecticut hedge fund, and has day traded equities with his own money. He loves trading, he loves writing about trading, and we're about to hear him really throw himself at talking about trading. Brent, welcome to the show. Sure. So my background or or my upbringing, I was always interested in both the creative side and then the math and puzzle side. And I grew up in the era of Liar's Poker and Wall Street, the movie and all that. Um, And funny enough, those are both cautionary tales I know now. Um, but at the time they were more like, uh, things that brought me into the business. Um, and I guess you could argue the same thing with reminiscences of a stock operator is that, um, it's, uh, kind of glorifies trading in a way that makes you want to trade. And then if you knew the full story, you may not want to trade quite as badly, but anyways, um, so those three things kind of got me interested in trading. Um, and then when I started in the business, it was very flow oriented, um, in 1995, I started. And so I actually did it for a couple of years and I found it was more like playing blackjack or something, um, than what I was kind of picturing like this exciting sort of macro position taking kind of environment. So I ended up quitting, um, and I went back home to Canada and I did some, some creative stuff. I had a TV show that was on in Canada, a cartoon. Um, and then I started trading my own money. And I traded through the NASDAQ bubble. And then over time, my strategy stopped working in around uh, 2001. And so I ended up, uh, and my TV show got canceled. So I ended up going back into the business. And really, though, the business had had changed quite a bit by then and was much less flow oriented. And so now I enjoy it much more. Plus, I've incorporated a lot of writing into, into what I do as well. So kind of found the balance between risk taking and and creative expression um so in that period i worked for lehman then when lehman went under uh, i went to a hedge fund and then i worked for a few banks since then okay terrific brilliant and um it, you know it's quite interesting because i read in a i read in the book um that line about you reading lies poker and being attracted to it and um that that was just about the same time i started in the markets and you know, I remember the book coming out and sort of reading it and, you know, really the whole idea of it was to to, to put this very unflattering uh, uh, portrayal of trading and financial markets in the industry. And yet I think that must have put tens of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people on the path to, I want to be part of that. Well, absolutely. Um, and also I... I write about this in the in my book a little bit about the importance of money and how that changes over your life cycle. But um, I grew up in like sort of lower middle class, and um, we had a friend of our family that that kind of hit it big in uh, selling their advertising firm. So I had a kind of a glimpse of what it might be like to have money, um, and that kind of motivated me too because you saw these pictures of wealth in in the movie Wall Street, and you know lo- those guys um, playing liars poker for a million dollars and all that. So as a kid kind of growing up in a in a row house or whatever, you see that and that's pretty attractive, even though that, that that kind of maybe my values are a lot different now. They you know, that's how they were at the time. 
Okay, brilliant. Uh, and we can go back to that because I think there's a lot in that. But um, it, it, we, we, I guess we're really here to talk about the book, um, Alpha Trader, The Mindset, method, Methodology and Maths and Mathematics of Professional Trading. Have I got the title right? Yeah, yeah. Easy for you to say. Easy for me to say, yeah. I've been working on that <laughs> all day. And, and you know, I've, I've, I've been reading it uh, sort of quite sort of uh, rapidly reading it over the past week to try and get myself up to speed with it and it, it's absolutely brilliant i mean it's that's the first thing i will say from from what i've read but i was also thank you i was also drawn to it by a couple of my own coaching clients who just last week i was talking to one said you know he's a hedge fund trader out in asia and he said you know this is up there with the best of them market wizards and uh, reminiscences of a stock operator uh, and that's a- you know he said it, 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 <laughs> If only it was available when he started. That that was kind of his comment. Uh, uh, well, uh, high praise. Uh, That's nice. And then I mentioned it to another trader who's a client of mine, an, uh, an FX trader, um, well, a senior manager at one of the banks, an FX bank. And uh, he just, you know, oh, brilliant. You know, Brett Donnelly said the, uh, the JK Rowling of the financial markets. So, <laughs> you know, but, it, but that, that really does speak to me about your creative streak. It's, you know, it's, it's clearly very much part of you and it's, it's clearly very much part of part of what you brought to trading and what you've brought to this. I, I certainly felt it when I brought when I, when I read the book that you know this is different. This is different to anything else I've come across. And uh, in a way, this is you know you've done make me a great favour because I wanted to write a book like this um, for many years. And, and first of all, I don't think I could have ever done half a job that you've done here. But secondly, it saved me having to do it now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm blushing over here. Um, I mean, the one thing I will say is I guess I went into it. So my first book was more um, about currency trading specifically. And so there's just a lot of boxes that you have to tick there in terms of, you know, delivering information if you want to appeal to all levels of skill. Um, so it comes across as kind of a bit of a textbook. Like it's definitely not a textbook, but it was a bit of it. And I felt a little bit constrained. Whereas with this book, I wanted it to be. Um, like definitely not boring. Like I wanted to tell some stories and have some fun. And, you know, like the first, the intro to the book um, is a story about a dollar yen trader. And I even wrote that part in third person just because it felt more dramatic, even though the story is about me. Um, So I felt like I had a little bit more license to to be creative here, even though in, in the end, I also wanted to write something that could work as say like a textbook for a trading 101 course or or something like that. And I, I guess the interesting thing too, for me was that uh, I actually learned a fair bit from from writing the book as well. Um, the first few chapters necessitated some research. And then, you know, a, an example of how I learned from writing the book myself was I was studying variance. And so if you create a simulator that just, if you know your, your rough trading statistics and you create a simulator in Excel, and then just run the simulation a hundred times. So you say, you know, your win percentage and you know, your average winning day and you know, your average losing day, then you run a simulation of, okay, how am I going to do a hundred years? If you, I'm going to run this a hundred for a hundred years. So 252 days, a hundred times. And you look at just how broad the range of outcomes is to me, that was like a real eye opener in terms of how important variance is. And I think I kind of knew that in my gut, but to see the distribution of like, say with, with my statistics of from 2006 to 2011, say, um, I I could have a year where I lost two million dollars or made 22 uh, was kind of like the range, and the and it's pretty evenly distributed in there. So I think that that was an interesting takeaway for me was I kind of understood variance, but I think that's one one hope, thing that hopefully people will take from this book is a much better understanding of variance because I think that's really important when you're on a losing streak. Like say, say I lose money five days in a row there, then I really need to have a good understanding of was that variance or is something broken in my process? Um, or, or, um, you know, do I need to change anything or am I fine? And I think if you don't really have like a real guttural or like a visceral understanding of uh, variance, people just tend to underestimate it. Yeah, I, it, this is something I see all the time. And, um, you know, I, 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 I talk about this often with my clients, this, this idea that, you know, you're not going to make money all the time. You're going to lose money a lot of the time. Um, 
you're going to lose money, possibly more than you win, depending on the style you adopt. And yeah. and um, and you've got to come to terms with that. You've got to have a bargain with yourself almost when you go into this job. But you don't realize it for many, many years. You know? No, no. And I, one thing that the me writing my piece, because um, I write this daily that goes out to people, and um, I put my trade ideas in there, and my time horizon is pretty short. So I tend to be wrong fairly often, just, you know, by definition, um, you're going to be wrong. If you have a short time horizon, you put out a lot of ideas, you're going to be wrong a fair bit. And so I kind of became immune to it after a while, because I know when I would try and get junior people to write trade ideas, people are hesitant because they don't want to look stupid and they don't want to be wrong. And that's human nature, right? Um, So, but if you're wrong enough times, you develop an immunity to it. And that can actually be powerful because now I feel like when I'm wrong, either publicly writing about it or wrong, just trading, I just don't really care. Cause I just know, I mean, my, I know what my statistics are and I know I'm going to be wrong basically half the time. Um, and then obviously the question is how you monetize the, the correct calls and how you risk manage the incorrect calls determines for me, that's what determines my P and L um, as opposed to my win rate, which is incredibly hard for me to change since I've been keeping stats since 2006 and my win rate um, on my daily stat, my daily P&L is always very close to 50%. And I find that really, really hard to move off, off of 50%. Whereas my ratio of my winning days to my losing days is the thing that, that I can influence when I'm trading well, that ratio is great. And when I'm not trading well, that ratio is poor. Okay. Okay. So, so not, not unlike Jim Simons really. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll, I'll ignore that one <laughs> but, you, you know it's it, you know what, there's so many lines in the book and so many stories and I'm just like you know I'm, I, I'm sort of doing a, a west of fist bump in the air every time I read it I'm like damn he's got it again damn he's got it right again <laughs> and it, even one of the great ironies was when you told the fist bump story and I'm like I fist bump the fist bump story <laughs> <laughs> so why don't i tell you about that i mean obviously you read it in the book but um that is an that's something that is unbelievably consistent and powerful and you just can't even believe it just keeps on working and now we're talking about like i think this concept was developed 18 years ago when i was so i was a manager at a bank and we started noticing every time someone cheers for a position that the that's the tippy top or the absolute low and and the things just turn from there and that person starts losing money. So that's always peak P&L when someone cheers. So I had a, I had my main book and then I had a management book. So I started putting um, a hedge. So if someone was long dollar Swiss and they started cheering, America, yeah, like on the strong US data or whatever, <laughs> I, I would take the opposite position in the management book. We called it the cheer hedge. So I'm, I'm hedging that guy's cheering because he works for me and I, I don't want the desk to lose money. And I'm not exaggerating that cheer hedge made money every single time. Oh, yes. And you even notice it. I even notice it now, like even say three months ago, someone yells on the trading floor or pumps their fist or whatever, or, or high fives. That's the tip. That's the top of their, of their P and L it's, it's uncanny. And I mean, it's people think of it uh, like it, you're jinxing yourself or whatever. I think I'm in, I take it from a more rational angle in that, the only time that you will ever do that is at the maximum velocity of the market when you're the most overconfident. Yep. Uh, you know, obviously you're not high fiving when you're seven ticks in the money on a on a trade when you're looking for a hundred. So it's it's just the ultimate representation or or um, expression of overconfidence, and it's uncanny. Um, I know some people even do it with the red headlines on Bloomberg, like if you see. Uh, Dollar Canada makes three month low or whatever. It's that's kind of like the magazine cover indicator where, you know, if the media is catching on to it, then obviously the trend has been going on for a while. I'm not I'm not saying I do that because I don't. But but I think there are kind of interesting other ways to to have anecdotal observation of of is the crowd getting a, a little bit too excited about whatever that thing is. Um, but on short term trading, definitely the cheer hedge is all powerful. Wait, I mean. You, Mark, you've heard me say this to you, haven't you? You know, I think um, I'll just tell a story very quickly and then I'll let you come in, Mark. But, if, you know, a, a while ago, we went to see an overseas client. We, you know, we, we do coaching, we run um, programs and workshops 
across the industry to you know financial markets and we'd been to see a client and we had a really great visit with them we'd been out for dinner with the you know the heads of trading and uh, as we were going back to the airport afterwards mark kind of went to sort of metaphorically give me a fist bump and i went no no i'm not doing it i'm not doing it <laughs> and he went why not and i went and i told him the story you know in trading rooms that was the, the that was the death knell for your position. I, I knew it. Yeah, you, know, you just don't do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I had it with another um, partner. I went to see a client a few years ago. Uh, we also, you know, big bank, and we did meetings with them, and they were going brilliantly. And on the way out, this guy fist bumped me. Um, I, I don't work with him now. You know, we, we in this industry, you have lots of like different partners. And um, as he did it, I was like walking out the door of the, the head office of this building. I was like, no, why did you do that? <laughs> I, I knew we weren't going to get the business at that point. So. And actually, a similar analog to that is when like the global head of trading sends around an email to the to the desk saying, great job, guys. Like, you know, you had a great month or whatever. Guess what's happening on the first day of the next month? <laughs> you got it. You got and it. So to avoid that, because like I'm a pretty positive person and and I do believe in you know motive I have had people working for me I want to motivate them in a positive way so we figured out I was actually a guy that worked for me that figured it out that the way that you do it is when someone's on a streak you just say nothing and then once they lose money like so say they're up seven days in a row and then they have a really bad day on the eighth day then after that eighth day you say hey that was a really good run overall nice job uh, but you don't you don't get involved until the runs well like clearly over yeah, no, that's great advice. I think the um, the fist bump thing is is interesting. The the loud people of trading rooms never survived, um, from from my experience. Um, I would say that um, the example Steve made about us, from a sales perspective, I think confidence is necessary. From a trading perspective, confidence kills you. And I think there are two different psychologies at play there. But certainly, from a trading perspective. You need to be so super careful. I, 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 I just want to cut across you there again, Mark, and then I'll let you carry on. I think overconfidence is dangerous. I think confidence is probably the greatest, one of the greatest commodities you need as a trader. Um, so it, 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 it's, I think there's a level, and I, I often call it a 70 to 75 percent level of confidence that you need, because otherwise you, you're racked with self doubt if you're underconfident. Equally, if you're overconfident, it's deadly. So I would say, um, and I, I talk about this in the book, is that I, I agree with that 100%, that it's a spectrum and there's a very narrow part of the spectrum that's optimal. And most people obviously are not on that because it's such a narrow part of the spectrum. And then, of course, even as an individual, you oscillate, right? So you are you tend to oscillate from overconfidence to underconfidence. And w one of the keys, um, and you get this from experience, is seeing uh, seeing yourself. So if you can step out of yourself and you see, whoa, I'm being really overconfident here, or just knowing the patterns. Like I always traded better when I was down compared to when I was up. Um, so understanding your own you know, trajectory or your own how you oscillate on that spectrum of confidence, and then trying to stay in that optimal, you know, uh, to assign an arbitrary number to it, like that seventy percent kind of area. Um, like you said, Steve, I think is is one of the great challenges is it, when you're doing well, not to be overconfident uh, and go on winner's tilt. And when you're doing poorly, not to lose your confidence and, and go on loser's tilt. Yeah, sorry. I'm really, Mark, I'm really sorry I can't cross you. But, you know, you were making a great point there. Do you want to just carry on with that? <laughs> I'll just carry on. Um, I also want to go back. I mean, the number of creative, frustrated creatives that I've come across in, in financial markets it is quite enormous. And I think that there, there is this need to have a balance across one's, you know, just what one's getting involved with. But you have too sterile a sort of approach, even to trading, I think you kind of get lost in it. But having a more balanced approach where, where you have this sort of creative sort of side of you coming to play is also, um, I think, really, really necessary to understand where your edge comes from. But if I, if I, I just want to go back into, into your book uh, Bren, I mean, part part one of the book digs into the equation of you know what 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 determines success um, or, or failure, uh, and, and just as we you know we face this audience that we face, um, 
Could you just go a little bit more into particularly the equation that determines failure? I'm not, we talk so much about success, but we don't talk enough about, well, what, what is the sort of formula that determines failure? Sure. Yeah. That's an, an interesting question. And, uh, and also as you kind of imply that the, the rules for success in trading do have a lot of overlap with the rules for success in life in general. Um, so it is interesting because the rules for failure in trading are pretty trading specific. Um, I mean, I, I would say the number one thing that kills people is impulsive over trading, um, trading for fun instead of for, for money. Um, and that's a very difficult one to get around because it's, it's, the personality of someone who likes to take risk is tends to be the person that tends to over trade. So what you want is a strong risk appetite and excellent impulse control. And those two things don't always go together. So that's, that would be number one. I think the other thing too, is just a lack of edge. So people don't understand what their edge is, or they think that they can have a simple edge looking at a chart and following a system. And in my mind, um, I know Steve uh, looks at the Gestalt philosophy, which I'm not deeply, deeply into uh, knowledge wise, but I know the idea is kind of bringing, bringing the parts into the whole. And I feel like trading is like that. You can't just be a breakout trader and, and hope to succeed. You can't even, in my opinion, just be a technical trader and, and hope to succeed. Uh, or y- it's not that it's impossible, but it's very, very unlikely. Um, and so I think a poor understanding of, of edge is, is another one. And then on the other side of the spectrum, a lot of people that work for me struggled on the other end of the confidence spectrum or, or the other end of the impulsiveness spectrum and just c- couldn't pull the trigger. We're always waiting for the perfect trade. Um, so again, it's this spe- idea of a spectrum and you you can't be impulsive, but you also need to be able to take a lot of incomplete information and imperfect situations and then re- take action and, and take you know, aggressive, courageous action in the face of a lot of uncertainty, because you're never going to get certainty. You're never going to get the perfect trade. And so that's the kind of the other end of the spectrum is some people just can't pull the trigger. So I would say th- those are the main, you know, the, the top ones would be too much impulsiveness or inability to pull the trigger. Uh, and then just no edge. I mean, no edge is really the fundamental number one thing because, the in trading you know people think of it as a zero-sum game and everyone thinks they're better than average in in every piece of every survey and every piece of research um so if you think it's a zero-sum game and you're better than average then you think you can win however first of all the average person is not better than average obviously (laughs) and on the other side uh it's not a zero-sum game it's a negative sum game so you need to make more money than than the transaction costs that you're paying and transaction costs are significant. So whether you're paying a, a visible commission or not, you're paying bid offer and you're paying other types of slippage. And so it's really hard to have an edge um, in, in a world that's populated by all the smartest people and the best computers. Um, so I, that's, that's the thing that I think every trader needs to be honest with themselves about is do I have an edge that's, that's likely to be persistent and yet, am I adaptable enough that I can adapt that edge as time goes on? Just coming in very quickly to remind our listeners that uh, the Alpha Mind podcast is sponsored by the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. If you're serious about trading and you're serious about developing yourself as a trader, do look into their home study course. It is based on the diploma program which they run at the world renowned London School of Economics. Uh, you can find out more about it on the Alpha Mind blog. Just Google Alpha Mind blog or go to alphamindblog.blogspot.com. And there you can find out how listeners to the Alpha Mind podcast can get a discount count on the full cost of this online course thank you and uh, back to the podcast yeah and of course having a plan and process is part part of that whole sort of argument about you know what what what, or not having a plan and not having a process will also lead to failure uh, as part of that whole sort of uh, recipe second part of your book is interesting because you start to look at traits you know the winning and, and the winning and losing 
traits, particularly around trading. Um, what have you found in, in your own journey that you, you know, as you wrote the book, you suddenly thought, actually, it took me a while to discover that. <laughs> Was there anything that turned up in, you know, writing a book is one thing, but trying to recap your own story and thinking, actually, if I'd have done certain things in the past, then I'd have learned to control myself a lot better in terms of the way I traded. So I would say looking at my history, um, you know, I've had some times when I was very successful and then times when I failed. I think the number one thing that I could have done better um, is in the area of conscientiousness. So conscientiousness has many facets, but um, it means grit and it essentially to me means doing the work. And so one time I saw a guy's Bloomberg header that said, a true professional comes in and does his best every day, whether he feels like it or not. And that definitely doesn't describe me in my 20s. Um, so I think part of and then I was also overconfident in my 20s. So I think those two things, uh, especially when you you meet your first, you know, three or four years of of success, it's easy to be overconfident. And that can lead to a lack of conscientiousness because you know, you're, you're having fun and you're, you know, maybe going out at night and not doing the work during the day. Um, and then eventually that leads to subpar performance. So I think if someone wants to come in and, and be extremely successful, a simple part of it is just doing the work. Like there are times, even on a trading floor at a, at a bank on wall street, when economic data will come out at say 10 AM when it's, you know, everyone's always ready at eight 30, but uh, some number will come out at 10 a.m. and dollar yen goes up 20 points since and, and a guy's yelling hey what's going on in dollar yen because they weren't prepared um and weren't expecting that economic data point um or another example is the central bank speeches um if, if you're going to trade really macro but anything related to monetary policy you need to know what the central banks are thinking and the number one way to get that is not to scroll the headlines it's to read the actual speeches uh, but the speeches are boring and a lot of people don't read them. Um, so again, that's just like simple conscientiousness, I think is it's the most malleable as well. So it's the area where you have the most chance of improving. If you look at the the big five um, and you look at how they evolve with age, uh, the research shows that conscientiousness is the one thing that we can, we can increase the most. And to me, that makes sense. Like I just used to be late all the time and, you know, kind of disorganized. And those are things that, you know, you read a few books on that kind of stuff and go to inbox zero, for example, and things like that. There's, there's simple ways that you can be much more conscientious. And, and then the other things I think are more difficult to manage. Um, so like intelligence, obviously, um, and, and rationality, those two things are a little bit more ingrained. However, they can also still be managed. Yeah, yeah, and, and but you know, one of the things I get from from reading your book, um, which I think you really capture very eloquently, and which, in many respects, is the essence of what we do on this this podcast and what we talk about, is really the the degree of reliance on on human nature, human skills, um, human abilities, attitude, mindset, balance. Um, it, it's really there in this book. You know, there's some things you can't control for. But, uh, you know, outside of that, you, understanding how you can't control for them is so important. And well, see, I think that's an interesting point is that that's to me is the next level of thinking is understanding what you can and cannot control. I guess that's the serenity prayer. I'm just realizing as I say <laughs> this, but um, but if, for example, my willpower is not very good. And so what I used to do was beat myself up over it or be like, OK, definitely going to have better willpower today. And if you fundamentally are kind of an impulsive person, and that's part of what makes me good at trading is that I don't sit there scratching my chin, I take action. But then as a person like that, that means, you know, the, the downside of that is that I'm, I'm more impulsive. So the better strategy I learned is to admit, okay, my willpower sucks. Now, what am I going to do about it? And there's lots of things you can do about it. You can implement, um, friction into unwanted behaviors. So one of the banks I worked at, you could trade on your phone at night. And normally when you work at a bank, you have to call into Hong Kong or Tokyo or whatever to trade. So if you could trade on your phone through an app, 
you know, it's just a lot easier to, to, to over trade or to listen to your impulses um, because the bar to trade is very low. So a simple example is I took that app off my phone because I knew that that's, that's not going to help me. Um, another one is automating your stop losses. So every time I put on a trade, as soon as I'm, you know, finished executing, I put stop losses in my automated system so that, um, first of all, it, you can't lie to yourself later and say, oh, my stop is actually at a different place. Um, but also it, it makes it rigorous and automated so that you don't have to worry about your willpower because the computer is just going to do it for you. So I think there's, you know, some things you try to improve and then some things you just have to admit your weakness and then introduce friction around unwanted behaviors or, um, or find ways to, to change your process so that it deals with that willpower and, or, or whatever that thing is, instead of smashing your head against the wall trying to fix something that maybe can't be fixed. Now, a lot of things can be, but I think it's also useful to just admit, okay, I have a weakness here now. How can I modify my process to address that weakness if I'm not going to be able to level up that weakness? And and I think that captures beautifully this this problem, which, you know, I, I keep running across all the time with people who think there's an answer, who thinks there's there's almost like a formula to this job. You know, it's it's one of the classic emails or messages I get often from people, particularly in the retail world, is, um, Steve, can you direct me to a mentor? I I, I don't mentor people, and I'll just make that very clear. I coach them, which is very different. Um, Could you point me to a mentor who can show um, a successful um, performance record over many years? And I'm going, no, that's that's not what you want. You want someone who's good at mentoring you, who understands the job. And, right, and, and right. it's going to support you and give you direction and judgment. You know, and you, you won't find that person with that track record. Because firstly, they're almost impossible to find. And secondly, if they're that good, they're probably focusing 100% on trading and nothing else. Um, but even then, you know, it's I, I don't know those people. You know, I know some incredible traders. But they've all had periods of underperformance. They've all had times where their method or their approach or the market regime has changed so much that they're, they're you know, they're, they're suffering um, extended underperformance. And actually, that's their greatness because they come back from that. Right. And I mean, that kind of speaks to, to a really important theme, in my opinion. So there's one idea, which is um, how to succeed, period, right? It, overall, how do you succeed? And then the next question is, how do you succeed in the long run? Because many traders will do well for three years, four years, five years, and then peter out or, or crash or 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 whatever. Um, so the question of how do you survive as a trader or prosper as a trader in the long run really comes down to adaptation. And um, there's lots of interesting examples, but one really interesting example was around 2004, 2005, the algorithms started coming in. And there was essentially two schools of traders. One school was like, this is BS. These algos are wrecking the markets. Every time I put a bid in, yeah. it jumps ahead of me. And then another school of traders was was saying things like, oh, this is this is market is kind of weird. What do I do about this? How do I, you know, what are they doing? Maybe I can do what they're doing, but better. Uh, or how do I, you know, get around what they're doing? Or how do I respond to it? Or how do I... How do I evolve in order to live in this new ecosystem? Because this is so different from the way it was a few years ago. And I mean, you can guess which group of traders survived and which ones didn't. Um, So I think anyone that sticks with one methodology, that's great for a few years, um, but regimes just change so much. So you have the big structural regime changes like the, the rise of the algos or the end of trend following as a successful strategy, for example. But then there's also little mini regimes, Um, you know, whether the VIX is at 10 or 25, those are two different regimes and you need to be able to adapt to those two things because your breakout strategy is probably going to work okay with VIX at 25, but your breakout strategy is not going to work when VIX is at 10. So I think that spirit of adaptation and then, I mean, the spirit's one thing, but then also the ability to adapt your process, um, is really important and i think again that's why that just all kind of um having a lot of different 
inputs into your process as opposed to a very simple process is important. And, and the, the quest for some simple solution is hopeless because there isn't one. Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole philosophy behind Gestalt really is, it, there's lots of different elements to it, but, you know, when I, when I learned it, and I, 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 was, I was already developing as an executive coach, and we learned lots of different methods, and one of them was we were introduced to, well, I think it's interesting, and it <laughs> just shows how the difference is in America, they often call it Gestalt, and here we call it mm-hmm. Gestalt, and it's actually a German word, um, and there is no proper def, um, translation into English of the word. The nearest one is form. You know, how does something form? What does the form look like? Is that form a true representation? In other words, is what you see really what you get? What if you change angle? What if you move to another another perspective? You know, what someone tells you. Oh, well, you know what's great about that yeah. is um, I think one big step that people take up in thinking is when you can step outside yourself and see yourself making mistakes. So quite often I'll make a mistake that I would same mistake I might've made when I was 28, but then I can step outside myself and actually see it happening and like say, Hmm, that's a stupid move. Why are you doing that? And so that's kind of that ability to see things from a different angle, I guess, is that you don't just see the actions that you're taking on one level, but but maybe you can see them through a more rational or objective set of eyes. Um, and and then that can help you. I mean, I've had situations where like I'm bullish, but I'm flat, nothing's going on. And then some stupid headline comes out and I sell and I'm short and I'll turn to the guy next to me and say like, I'm bullish and I'm short right now. This This makes no sense. And then, you know, when you can make that obser- observation of, of your own behavior, of, or, then you, then it's possible to reverse it. And, you know, in that case, then I would say, well, obviously I should cover this because this is dumb. Um, but I think if I was 25, I, I would actually instead probably be justifying why it's a good position. Um, so there's a great quote. It's in the book, um, but it, it's not for me. So I'm, I'm fine saying it's great. Um, from Michael Batnick. And he said he was playing around at one point with, you know, in cons- like not huge money uh, in the options market. He was buying puts and calls and he meant to buy a call because he was bullish on a stock and accidentally clicked wrong and, and bought a put. And he said, well, I guess I'm bearish now. <laughs> yeah. I thought, I, I love that. The human, the human mind has plays some weird tricks. So if you can uh, have another level of thinking where you actually see your mind playing those tricks, that's, I, I think that was a big step for me was was not necessarily fixing every single little mistake, but more seeing the mistakes while they're happening and then being able to correct uh, course correct quickly instead of, you know, instead of doubling down on on mistakes. You know, you know it's, it's interesting because, um, I, you know, I often talk about the greatest trade or the greatest couple of traders that I've ever coached. Um, and they, they, they are some phenomenal individuals. They do have that ability. And I've often talked about this one guy who almost had an ability to see himself as he traded. Um, And listeners might have heard me talk about this guy many times because, you know, he was also a a poker champion as well. And he almost had the ability to see himself playing the game of poker as he was playing it. And it it was like a superhuman. You know, (laughs) if there there is a gift, um, a superpower, I think, in trading, I think that is it. Right. And I mean, that kind of goes a little bit, Mark, to your point about creativity um, and non-standard thinking is that trading isn't just about book smarts. And I mean, I emphasized conscientiousness and doing the work before. And to me, that kind of stuff is just the absolute bare minimum. Like if you're not willing to do the work every day, don't even bother because there's no chance you'll succeed. Um, but then the next level is is that more creative type of stuff where, you know, it takes a certain level of creativity to be able to <laughs> hover up out of your consciousness and then stare down at your at your form at the poker table or at the trading desk and and then make judgments about that individual who is actually you you know that takes a creative mind and i think mark that's kind of what you were alluding to is that i think people view wall street as you know this increasingly quantitative place and all that but uh, i kind of disagree i think the good traders that most of the good traders that i know are are quantitative and have those, you know, that intelligence, but then they also are generally pretty creative people. 
No, I know that um, some of the guys that I would call almost masters of the universe that I've uh, I've interacted with over the years, that quite a few of them had this, you know, sort of quirky need to guess rock out in uh, rock out on their own guitar or, or or create music, or there was one guy that just had this garage full of different canvases and he, he gets splatter painted, but that was his creative edge. And it, I know you talked about trading traits, but actually. Some of the, the very positive traits that can drive us are the non-trading traits. You know, the, the things that go guessed in the life, what's going on apart from, you know, the sort of, you know, 7 a.m. till 6 p.m. day that you're trading in. And so Absolutely. We get, and we get powered. We get powered from that. And if we're not powered by that, we, we can turn up to a trading day with the best piece of kit on the planet in front of us and the best process. But if But if we've been... You know, taken off course by the fact we've just not been looking after ourselves, and I guess that comes with self-observance as well, and even noticing that we're we're not paying attention to ourselves, then the whole thing just starts to fall apart. And it's a little bit like you know, obviously there's this mindfulness um, sort of passion, and you can have as much mindfulness as, as as you fancy, but if you're not keeping yourself hydrated, if you're not getting enough rest, if you're not getting access to fresh air, you might as well not bother with mindfulness. Yeah, so it's almost there's, and I guess this feeds back into Gestalt in a way, this holistic sort of vision of self. Um, but a lot of the components of Paris are not necessarily ones that are the obvious ones. Right, and I think that kind of correlates to the conversation between book smart and street smart. Right, is that street smarts involves more than just quantitative rigor and and all that, and a, a related trait. Um, to this conversation also, I think is curiosity. So the people that are really good traders just tend to be curious. And I, th- I think for me, a lot of times that gets me through the, the down times is I'm just, I just want to know what's going to happen next. A lot of the times, like I'm not all that motivated by money. I'm more motivated by, you know, curiosity of, of, you know, is, is this inflation going to be transitory or not? Like I'm genuinely super interested to know that whether or not it's going to matter for my portfolio or my trading I'm just curious about that. And then I think you can actually take it a step further and and kind of pers- this sounds a little contrived, but but I don't think it is contrived is you can kind of pursue this intentional create curiosity. So whenever you see something, you know, when you're reading a, an academic paper or a speech or something and there's something in there you don't understand, you have two choices. You can just kind of skip, skip to the next part of the speech or the or whatever you're reading or you can go Google it and read about it and then go into the rabbit hole for, for an hour and, and then learn about it. Um, and I think that intentional curiosity really, really helps um, from a lot of angles because it also takes you into reading about things that you might not have before. Um, and I feel like in trading, you know, reading about how uh, like narratives reproduce in, in the wild, uh, whether it's related to trading or not, you know, that has a ton of value for my style of trading because I'm always trying to study what the narrative is and, you know, is it, is it overcooked or is it getting stale or is it still have juice? Um, so reading, for example, reading about, you know, social epidemics and things like that can really help. And so that fundamental idea of just staying curious, I think really leads to a lot of upside for trading, even though it's, again, it's not really like a thing you generally associate uh, with trading. I think it actually helps a lot. It's it's interesting, isn't it? Because curiosity is how do I solve this problem, and how do I solve this emerging problem, and how do I solve this? Then, you know, what is happening here? You know, it, it, it's perhaps it's why you know we, we we've noticed a tendency for people who have got backgrounds from sport, music, the arts, and, and you said you, I think at the beginning you said you created your own TV program at one point. correct, and, and also engineers who are constantly trying to problem solve. How, how often they seem to do better than most people when they enter the field of trading. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. And again, it probably speaks to the, you need the book smarts, you know, that's the minimum um, necessary condition and to succeed on Wall Street or in, in trading. Um, but you also need those other things, which are kind of, I, I think you can kind of bundle. I mean, I don't talk, I don't call it street smarts in the book, but I think you can bundle a lot of these things into, into that second type of intelligence, um, whatever, however you want to label it, which is the non-quantitative, um, non-rational type stuff. 
Is, is there, do you think there's a danger at the moment in on the street that there's too much hiring of people with um, with the wrong qualifications and wrong degrees? It's gone so much towards people with quant backgrounds that, that, that maybe there's something being missed. Uh, I would say 100% yes. Um, so I've been involved in many analyst programs at different banks. And there is just, I think there's the, uh, there's an overemphasis on only going to the top schools, um, which, you know, leads to, or sorry, leads to a lack of diversity. I don't necessarily mean, um, you know, racial or, or gender diversity. I just mean intellectual diversity where people just feel very similar. And then you see the the more creative and different people really stand out. And then those are obviously the people that I would be trying to hire. But I, I do think that there's way too much emphasis on the school and the GPA. Um, but I understand why. I mean, you know, you're creating a system where 100 analysts are coming in, you have to look at something and you have to filter them somehow. But it does lead to, I think, um, a much more generic or the risk of a, of a more generic candidate. And then you need to go through those generic candidates and find the, the people that are not so generic. Um, because uh, the thing is with, at this point in, you know, in the, at least in the U S cause that's where my experience is every single person coming out of a good school. And I don't mean Ivy league. I mean, just any of the, you know, even one step below that, those people are all very intelligent and they, they know how to do work. They know how to take tests they know how to to you know understand statistics probably from from their background, so that's that's not the issue. The issue isn't is never a lack of quantitative skill. It's all the other stuff that you really have to select for, and maybe that stuff's hard to select for as a recruiter. So it ends up getting selected for on the desk instead. Yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got a great example for that. I mean, when I was at. Uh... A very standard school in London. We uh, had an opportunity of spending some time at Eton College. And I, st- I went to stay at Eton for three days and uh, obviously significant top school. Uh, whilst Henry of Eton was meant to come and stay in my house, but Henry had chicken pox and didn't end up coming, but they still let me go. Um, and one of the guys I, I hooked up with, who, who now is a, a significant lawyer, barrister, you know, sort of guy, I yeah. said, well, let's, 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 let's meet up over the summer and have a game of golf on Wimbledon Common. So we, we went up there, we played a game of golf, and I've teed, teed off on the second hole, and I've just nailed it. He's teed off and almost took out this guy about 200 yards away walking his dog. And this, guy, <laughs> this, and this guy's waving, about 200 yards away, waving the walking stick at us, right, shouting his head off. The guy next to me is crying, okay, and he's crying for the next 45 minutes. And that taught me a lot. That taught me that you can go to the smartest school on the planet, but you're not street smart. You haven't got any sense of what the real world is like. And forgive, I forgive those that are listening that may have come from such schools, but actually my first-hand experience is that, okay, he was pretty smart, but he couldn't survive out in society because he just didn't know how to cope. Right, 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 absolutely. And I mean, I guess that's kind of what trading can be like, right? Is that you feel like crying a lot when you're trading. <laughs> Good. Good. Yeah, it's just true. But I think street smart works in trading. Just look at the guys on the floors, you know, on, on the trading floors. A lot of those were, were guest savvy, you know, they just knew, they, they, they could feel the market. They, they knew what edge meant in a very street, street smart sort of, you know, they didn't have degrees. Few of them had degrees, but they were right. I mean, even like I'm, I was kind of the last generation. So like I went to an okay school in Canada. It was fine, um, but I was kind of the last generation where there were people that I worked with that came up literally through back office or th- even one guy through the mailroom, like the old school way. I mean, but that's the last generation that can ever happen. Yeah, yeah. And now you know the only way to really get in is to come from a top school. And I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that doesn't make sense on some levels, but it definitely creates the potential for people that are really good at taking tests, but but not necessarily good at other stuff. Yeah, but there, I mean, there still are some some good quality people, but they're, they're normally coming in through prop shops, prop firms. If, if Right. Um, Jack Schrager's book last year, Unknown Market Wizards, um, there's three individuals in there who I've coached. And 
one of them went to Imperial College. So that was one of the best ones. But the other two went to very low quality universities, um, you know, sort of in the in the UK. Um, if, if you live in an inner city school, it's very hard to get to qualify for a, a good university. So you end up at what's often a kind of vocational university. Um, and I think one of them was ranked, one of the universities that one of them went to was ranked 120th in the UK out of 124. Um, but this, this individual got a job at a prop firm. And I, I won't mention his name, but you could read about him in the book. And, and so actually, so two of them did, went to these sort of universities. Now, one was really keen to get into trading or into a bank, into a bank job. And he applied to about 100 bank trading jobs. He didn't even get one single response from one firm. And then he got a job, got a job as a risk manager. Um, he saw an advert uh, for a prop firm. And then after a year, they took him on the desk as a prop firm. And this guy is the most incredible trader. And like I say, he's in Unknown Market Wizards. Um, I know the guy personally. I know how much money he's made over the years. Um, talk about street smart. I mean, this guy's head is so, you know, and, and he trades every market. He can be, you know, he's mostly macro markets, FX markets. But then he'll jump to corn. He'll jump to oil. He'll jump to the S and P's. He, he mm -hmm. has just got everything in his head, and he sees it. And you know, as I was reading your book, and you know, I know when I talked to him, he talks about the current market narrative, market sentiment. He's got his own Bloomberg screens in front of him. He's got an office where he's got real vision running in the corner. Um, and he just pulls it all together and finds these trades and finds these great asymmetric risks. But sometimes he'll go with the momentum moves when there's not a great asymmetric risk there. But, you know, he's just, he's with sentiment and then he'll go against sentiment. He'll go contrarian to sentiment. But he just brings it all up within him. And he's been doing this for 10 years. Well, I think longer now, actually. Um, well, I think that's one of the beauties of trading, and that's um, something that attracts a lot of people to it, is that it's kind of the good thing and the bad thing about trading is that it, there's very low barriers to entry. There, you know, you can find a way to get into trading, even if you don't come in through a, through a bank analyst program. There's other ways, as as your um, friend or, or whatever um, uh, demonstrates. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, like poker or professional sports or, I mean, trying to be a uh, fiction writer, the low barrier to entry and very high payoff means success rates are going to be low. But the good thing is, I think that if you work hard and have the skill and have the, you know, the X factor, you can find a way to get into it. You don't have to come in through a bank. You can go in through a prop shop. You can, you can do it by trading your own money, which I know many people have succeeded uh, one note about uh, Unknown Market Wizards. So I've read all the Market Wizards books. And when that one came out, I was kind of like, well, do I need to read another Market Wizards book? And it, that book is unbelievable. It's so good. I was really, really, um, really excited about how good it was because um, you'd feel like all the stories have been told, but it's just never the case, right? I mean, Jack obviously is good at extracting the stories from people. But um, anyways, yeah, I just thought that was a great book. Yeah, no, it's terrific. I mean, I, you know, I sort of, you know, I, I, I've read all of them over and over. And this was one of the interesting things. When I was a trader, I, I, I used to read it almost every year. And then I'd, I'd pick it up and I'd, um, I'd I, I'm making that mistake. And then I realised on the next page, I made a note that I'm making that mistake and never to make it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, those books are, are incredible how you can read the first Market Wizards and it's still a great book. Um and and the the thing I think that's powerful about the that book is that or those books is that obviously those are shining examples of people that have been very successful, and it's not like a majority of those people blew up afterwards. You know, like those are those people had persistent success. Um, so I think that's a really so I always steer people towards those books and not towards reminiscences because I think reminiscence of a stock operator is fantastic entertainment, but it's also an example of of you know how not to manage risk and how to how to blow up and all that um which again it's i think there's some cautionary tale aspect in there but it's it's more of a glorification of of how to trade for fun yeah yeah I mean, one, one, but it's a great book it, it is but one of the ironies of market wizards is 
how often they blew up at the beginning. And it, it, right, it's, almost, right. it's almost a qualification for being, being a successful trader. And almost true, the worst true. thing that can happen is, is an early run of success. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's the second blow up that's not forgivable. The first one is uh, is definitely understandable. Uh, no, one hundred percent. I think Mark, you want to do, come in there? Well, we are here to talk about Alpha Trader. Yeah, don't forget. absolutely. <laughs> well, as I said at the beginning, you know, some of the feedback I've already got is that this is an instant market classic. I, it's a it's a great book. I think the, I think the myriad sources of cr trader kryptonite that you uh, allude to in some of the uh, some of the sales blurb that goes out of the book it gets a very interesting way of positioning it there's a hell of a lot of stuff out there that can kill you um and of course we all know that professional trading is a lifelong journey of self-improvement struggle adaptation and hopefully success absolutely and, and i kind of i would think i say this in the book but I don't claim to be the holder of absolute truth on, on any of these matters. Um, but I have made a lot of mistakes and, and I've had success and I've had failures. So I feel like I have a story to tell and, it, um, and then people can, can take the lessons that apply to them and, you know, ignore what doesn't apply to them. And hopefully that can help people get better at their jobs. <laughs> yeah, I think as, as you say, is, is be rational and self-aware, learn, adapt and grow and unleash the alpha. Absolutely. Can I, can I just ask you, Brent, because there was one story in there which you never really built upon, which was where you, you thanked a manager for encouraging you to take more risk, not to, I think you'd got to a certain threshold when you started at Lehman's in a very, yep. very short space of time. And it, your experience until then had been of a manager's saying, well, try not to lose any more. But this manager mm -hmm. said, you know, you're in a great run here, keep going, try and push the boat out. Could you tell us a bit more about that experience and that, that year even? Because I think that would require sure. a lot of people listening. So, I mean, this is a specific thing to working at a bank, but generally you have a budget. So if you work at a conservative bank and you get to your budget in May, then the philosophy is, you know, kind of just ring the register and be conservative. And so I had come from a conservative bank and then I went to Lehman Brothers and um so my budget was i think my budget was six million dollars and i was up six in june or something that roughly if i recall um so i went to him and i said um and i'm still in touch with him actually uh, but i went to him and i said okay so what's the you know what's the appropriate strategy here i'm up six and my budget's six do you want me to just kind of monetize whatever comes in and, and chill out and he like turned red and started basically yelling and saying like, no, dude, this is the time to see what kind of a trader you are. The only time you can really see how good you are is when you're in a very strong position. And the only time you're in a strong position is times like this. You know, you can't press on Jan 1 on, on the 1st of January because you, you the path dependence of, of that whole year, you don't want to tie up your whole year in, in how you do in the first two weeks of the year. So but if you're if you're at budget in June, then that gives you the opportunity to to take a drawdown and you still have plenty of time to make it back, but also then to, to maybe take more risk and, and see what kind of trader you are. And so in that case, that was 2008. So, um, you know, which uh, depending on what products you were trading was a fantastic year to trade. So it was a great call. And I ended up up 50 bucks that year, $50 million that year. And I honestly was up six at that point and thinking like, Oh, am I supposed to just sit back and take the six? Um, so it, but it was a really eye opener for me because I think it was the perfect time too, where I was kind of transitioning from junior to more senior trader. Um, so it, and it also really cemented in my mind for future that it's, it's tricky because you don't really want to trade your P and L what you want to trade is market opportunity. Right. But the, what you can do is have a process that takes more risk when you're in a strong financial position and takes less risk when you're in a weak position. Um, and so I guess I didn't fully appreciate just how much you can tweak your process. And really, like if you go from six to four um, in the first two weeks of June or July, you, you know, you're still in a fine position. Um, so I guess it kind of crossed me a little bit over to the idea that you kind of have to trade your P&L a little bit not on an intraday basis, but on, uh, on a year to year basis, depending on what your incentive structure is and where you work. For me, I felt like the part of the lesson there was that understanding where you are and how strong you are P and L wise 
is important because that's how you get the really outsized returns is taking more risk when you're in a strong position and there's a really good market opportunity. And what you don't want to do is say, okay, I'm up $6 million. I'm going to bet you on this trade just because I'm up so much. That's bad. Obviously that's bad trading, but having a process that mechanically increases risk as your free capital or as your, your um, P and L increases, I think that's the way that you get more exponential upside without ever introducing the risk of ruin or the exponential downside. Yeah, and I, I think that's a great strategy for trading. And it's um, it, it's something I try and advocate, advocate people to do, but it's, it's actually quite counterintuitive. Well, it is because I think it's not rational, right? Is that you should be, t- you, the rational approach in theory is that you should take the same amount of risk on January 1st as on July 31st, if the opportunity sets the same. However, it actually is rational. And the reason it's rational is that there's path dependence in p l So if you lose $2 million in January, guess what? You, you're you in a, you're not going to probably, your probability of doing well in those subsequent 11 months is low. Um, so part of it, it to me is essentially creating a process that makes your p l look like a call option. So you have to build a sum base of P&L, regardless of the opportunity set. You can't take maximum risk until you have some base of P&L to work with. And then that way, um, your your risk appetite is correlated to your P&L. But overall, the number one driver of your risk appetite has to be the opportunity set, not your P&L. And then the P&L is more of you have a spreadsheet and it kicks out how much risk to take. And that amount of risk that you should be taking, depending on, you know, aligned with conviction should relate to your P&L somewhat. Um, because to me, uh, it's unambiguous that if you're up $10 million on July 1st, you should be taking more risk than than on January 1st. Um, so the reason it's rational is that, well, one, there's path dependence and, and you know, you have a, a lower bound at which you have to reduce risk and it gets really hard to come back. Um, and then two also is you need to understand, usually there's a meta game wherever you work, right? There's a risk manager who you don't want to make anxious. And there's, there's certain amounts of money down that are going to make someone tap you on the shoulder or send you an email. And you would generally want to avoid those things. Um, and so going from up 10 to up eight is just completely different from going from flat to minus two, even though both of those are $2 million losses. The, the impact on you psychologically is different. The impact on your manager is different. Um, the fear of, of ruin is completely different. So uh, even though it doesn't seem rational, I, I definitely believe it is rational to to modify your risk taking based on your, your P&L or your capital. Do, you know, hear, hearing you talk about this, it's and, and again, I, I, you know, this was a very, very clear thing within the book, which again, why this book is slightly unique. You go beyond the standard you know, let's be disciplined, let's be focused, let's work a system, let's define an edge. You bring in some really important things which are often not talked about. You know, for example, you said, you know, with a bank trader, you know, you have to worry how your manager is. If your manager's risk averse, there's no way you're going to be able to push the bow out on risk. On, on the other right. hand, you know, if you've got a manager who wants to push the bow out a bit, you know, it's a bit of a license to go and do it. Um, and that's right. going to support So you. that's the... But the metagame yeah. kind of, right? Also, you talk about it with the private retail trader. You know, what is your wife? How is she going to react to you having drawdowns or not bringing an income for a long time? And I, I, I talk about this often with retail traders, you know, who say, I'm, I've decided to leave my job and go and become a retail trader. And I say, well, have you asked the most important person <laughs> mm-hmm. who, who this, who, who, who's about, who, this, who is going to be the most important stakeholder in this and they went who are you talking right. about went, your wife or your girlfriend or your husband or your partner you know you're going to be yeah. living off them for a lot of the time and they're going to be thinking man there goes five years of holidays or there goes the extension on the house or you know right uh, and they're not going to be thinking that first they're going to be thinking well, what the hell are you doing you know uh, okay if you think this is going to make money and then a year later when you go you know when i was flat or i lost 20 grand in my first year and they're going to well, they, they're not going to understand what you're doing they won't understand this game they're going to say, well, I thought you were going to win. I thought you were going to make money. You know, <laughs> yeah. you, you have to be and, honest with them and, and bring them in and try to explain to them how this works. Because when they get anxious and antsy, it's going to affect you. When they're like, 
you know, where are you going with this six months or a year down the line? That's going to affect right. who you are. And that's why some people don't like trading other people's money. Um, you know, some people who are successful as traders say get their account from 25K up to 500K, then they start taking outside money and it doesn't work out because it's just a different psychological frame or psych psychological situation that you're in where you don't feel bad about losing your own money, but you do feel bad about losing your, you know, father-in-law's money or whatever. Um, and really that whole section that you're talking about in the book, really it all comes down to a healthy trading environment. So trading is just so difficult that if you're not in a healthy environment where, you know, with appropriate risk appetite from above uh, or below or, or wherever, um, then it's just, I think, Trading is so hard that if you don't have those things lined up, it just becomes impossible. I mean, I've worked in, in environments where, you know, the, the, it's, it's the people joke about it. They call it the take risk, but don't lose money model um, at banks. So the people joke about that's a conservative approach that some banks take is essentially, you know, if you make money on a flow, you can risk that money, but don't lose money ever. And, you know, for me as, as a, person with strong risk appetite who really enjoys trading i did not the one time i was in that environment i didn't like it and so you know i took steps to get out of it um and i, I think that's really important is for people to especially when you're new somewhere like obviously if you've been trading at a fund for seven years you know exactly what you need to do and that this isn't relevant but um but i think this applies to all areas so you mentioned retail but then even if you're going into a hedge fund i always tell people make sure you have enough runway because there's so much luck in trading, right? For in the short run that if, if you go sit down and it's a bad environment for your, your thing that you do, you know, if, if FX vol is zero for the first four months that you sit down and then two months later, they're saying, Oh, what's wrong with this kid? That's not good. So I think at every level of trading, you need to understand what is a healthy environment and and am i going to be sitting down in a healthy environment and what you don't want is to sit down and feel tremendous pressure what you want to sit down at if you're sitting down at a, at a hedge fund is i mean ideally you want to know that you have two years of runway and you have you have a fair chance to to do what you're good at yeah yeah and, and i think a lot of a lot of people who go to hedge funds fall victim to that they, they want to make you know that they, they, they want to sort of uh, swing for the fences in the first three to six months as if and show how good they are and they they, they force themselves sometimes when the conditions just aren't right um, right i mean i made that mistake when you come to a bank especially like if you're a bit more senior so people are like oh this new guy's here you know you feel like you have a lot of eyes on you and then you kind of want to prove yourself but you can't prove yourself in three months anyway so um you know but i have made that mistake too of feeling like i gotta you know take a ton of risk maybe that's not related to the opportunity set just because you feel like a lot of eyes are on you and you, you want to show that you're a good hire or that you're, you know, you want to, you want to validate the person, maybe the individual who hired you or whatever, but the way to do that is actually just to be smart, not to, not to show off. Yeah. Yeah. But, but again, it just shows, shows us that, you know, we're, we're all human and we all have that side to us somewhere. Right. Absolutely. And I think, um, in that vein, I think a lot of people like to beat themselves up and really like, I'm not that kind of person. So that's never been a thing for me, but I know a lot of traders that have worked for me. That's something that we always have to work on is, you know, just moving to the next, like in poker, a bad beat happens or you make a mistake. Now the new cards come out and it's a new hand and you really have to be able to ring fence each event and which to me, each event is a new day. So you know, whatever, even if I'm down five days in a row, I'm, I'm pretty good at coming in on the sixth day and still taking the same amount of risk in, in, a, in, you know, the same process. But a lot of people do struggle with that. And I think the ability to kind of flush your mind and, and think of, think of trading, just like you would think if you play poker as each new hand is a new opportunity and any thoughts that are bleeding over from that prior hand are really going to mess up your thinking on this new hand. So just look at the cards you have in front of you and, and play. Okay, Mark. Uh, nothing to add, really. I, you know, I think we got. A, there's a real difference between the retail trader and the, the pro trader working for a bank. Um, you know, the trader working for a bank essentially is doing is doing a job within a 
highly charged, often political environment where you kind of have to be a bit careful. And you're not just, you haven't just got trading risk, you've got sort of other sorts of risk going on. And the parameters are often just not set by you either. So I think they're, they're, they're two different animals. I think an awful lot of what we talk about in, in these podcasts is, is, is far more relevant to, you know, the man that's looking after his own money, that sort of has his own risk, that is trying to work on that very fine balance of, of, of just making a living out of this. I mean, you can work in the bank and just get salary and have a bad year and you're still going to have a living. Um, but, you know, a bloke that's sitting behind a screen do, doing a pure, pure, pure retail job of, of putting his own money on the table, you know, kind of has to be really, really focused upon just what that edge means to him. Yeah, that's, what, um, that, that's eat what you care, that eat what you care attitude. Yeah, exactly. And it, we, you can't compare. You can't compare a retail trader with a guy working in a bank. Well, I think the way the conversation applies too is that um, as a retail trader, because I think a lot of people are trying to determine when to quit their job um, and to trade full time, yeah. is having a good understanding of, of what kind of account you need to get that runway, right? To get at least 12 to 24 months of runway um, so that your account's not too small and you just end up turning it like gambling because you need to double down. Um, so that the idea of, of a supportive and healthy trading environment is radically different, like you said, for for everyone um, at a in retail versus a bank. But the concept I think overall applies, which is, do I have runway and do I have support, and whatever that means in your environment, that that is super super important. Yeah, no, hundred percent. But listen, Brent. I mean, this has been a great chat, um, but I think we we have to start sort of uh, winding it down now. Now, where can people find out more about you? Can you tell them again about the name of the book, where they can buy it? I believe it's self-published, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's on Amazon. Uh, that's the easiest way to get it. My website is my name, uh, brentdonnelly.com. So there's a bunch of stuff on there. I, I publish some writing uh, on Epsilon Theory. So there's some links on there um, and some old pieces that I've written. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff on there, including links to both my books. Um, and yep, the new one's called Alpha Trader. And yeah, I mean, you can also, if you want to support local bookstores, which I, I'm a fan of, you can just go to your bookstore and order it and the, they can get it for you. It's it's available through all the standard distribution channels, um, the way that books get to, to different bookstores. So if you want to stay local, just go to your bookstore and, and you can order it and uh, they'll have it for you. Terrific. And, and is there going to be an audible version now? There will be, but... Um, it's I'm planning on voicing it myself. So it's just a matter of, of doing it. Uh, but I do, I, I am in the process, let's say. Okay. Terrific. Terrific. Cause I, I, you know, a lot of, a lot of trainers like to put it in the car when they drive to the station these days. Right. Right. I mean, I personally, I would say about 80% of the books I consume are audio books. Yeah. So I'm definitely a fan. Um, but I wanted to do the voicing myself cause I, I feel like with nonfiction, I like books better when the author does it. Um, but it's just, it's a pretty big time commitment. So I'm just working on it right now. Okay. Fantastic. Great. Well, well listen, Mark, anything you want to add or do you want to take us out? Yeah. And I think, uh, we're, we're grateful for the, um, the amount that you've exposed, I think in this book is, is, is a great piece of work, very necessary for the, the library of the world of trading to have this sort of uh, view from someone that's seen both sides really. And, uh, this has brought some of the stories to life. I think that the messages really that I think are really important to take away is you know, people have got to do the work, as, as you've said. I think this, this thing about confidence is a is something that's underestimated too too much, and it's you know it'll kill you too little. It'll kill you, kill you. But having the right amount is is is, is important. So this idea of self self observance, so actually knowing what what state you're in, I think is is very critical. And having, actually having this conscientiousness, I think, also that you really play upon. Just be conscious and conscientious to what you do and kind of understand the impact of it on you and your risk and your trading platform, but also you know, the bigger picture. You know, what's it mean to my family if I suddenly get this on board and it all goes pear-shaped? So, Brent, we're really grateful. I think Alpha Trader is a, a super cool book and... Um, you know, must a must read for many, along with the uh, 
the other wizards that are there in the marketplace. So well done. We're very grateful for your time. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate the kind words and I have a lot of respect for the work that you guys do. I've been listening to the podcast for a long time. So thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening today and we hope you enjoyed and got something out of this podcast episode today. And if you did, we would really appreciate it if you could go on to um, the ratings or review page of whichever podcast service you use and leave hopefully a favourable rating and uh, a pleasant review about the Alpha Man podcast. We do enjoy bringing these to you. We get a lot of pleasure from it. Um, we hope you get something out of it. Um, if you want to know more about us and our service, do look us up on alpha-mind.net. You can also go onto our blog page, alphamindblog.blogspot.com. You'll find articles, past articles, links to past podcast episodes. Um, you'll also see connections to pages where you can get a discount on the STA home study course. And again, thank you to our podcast sponsor, the Society of Technical Analysts, the STA. You can also find a discount code for the uh, Traders Mind Journal on there, which is uh, a product we spoke about on our uh, podcast a few weeks ago. Please also do feel free to connect to us. If you're interested in our services, in our coaching services, in our coaching programs, you can look up more details about those also on the blog page um, or contact us info at alpha-mind.net um, and we can tell you more about them. Or do contact myself or Mark directly on Twitter my handle is at alphamind101. Mark's handle is at alphamind102. Or you can connect with us and contact us through LinkedIn. Again, if you're interested to know more about our work. As a reminder, we work with individual traders, um, both on the sales side and the buy side. We work with retail traders, um, investment bank traders, energy firm traders, traders in hedge funds and asset management firms. We also work with people connected to the trading world. We are executive coaches. So we work with leaders and managers and teams within businesses, helping to make the businesses more effective and more productive. One last thing, we do have a newsletter um, and there's good information about us. Always a useful article on there, links to previous episodes. So you, you can subscribe for that also on the Alpha Mind blog page. Finally, that just leaves us to say thank you once again. And we wish you the very best of luck in the markets.